everybody and a very warm welcome to Worship and the Word. When I say from St John's Green Gates, obviously we're still scattered and dispersed, but on behalf of St John's Green Gates, we're really delighted that you're joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name's Chris, I'm uh, part of the uh, team at St John's and it's my privilege to not only welcome you, but uh, start our worship off as it were this afternoon, which will involve a number of different people from within our community and we hope that uh, you're richly blessed by it. We're particularly delighted uh, to have as our speaker today, Stuart Hacking. Um, Stuart is the chaplain at Emmanuel College uh, in Idle and uh, a part of the team at Holy Trinity as well. So uh, great to have Stuart sharing something of God's word with us on this last Sunday uh, in April. As we gather, let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for your welcome to each and every one of us. Thank you that in this Easter season, uh, despite all that's going on around us in our world and in our lives, we celebrate that Christ has won the victory over sin and sickness and death. And as we come together this afternoon and meet in his name, we want to worship you, we want to give you our thanks, as well as bringing our prayers to you, the God who hears, the God who understands, the God who is love made known supremely in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Led like a lamb to the slaughter, you're alive, you're alive, you have risen. Is given. 
me strength for every passing day. A glimpse of glory now revealed in meager parts, yet drives all fear away. I stand in Christ with sins forgiven, and Christ in me. For those who don't know me, my name's John Capewell, and I'm a part of the team supporting the communities of Greengate and Appley Bridge through the St. John's Community Church here at Greengate. Now, like many of the vulnerable in their fifth week of shielding, I've had plenty of time to reflect upon what I've actually done with my life. Later this year, it will be 60 years since I first went to church. At the age of eight, I joined my local church choir, where we would practice every Friday evening for the two or more services on the Sunday at which we would sing. I've always loved music of all different genres, but it was singing in worship that still gives me the most joy. Having a birth syndrome which impacted upon my lungs and breathing, it was singing that provided me with an easy way to carry out my breathing exercises. Impaired hearing is also part of my syndrome, and this greatly affected my school education. I excelled in everything that involved working with my hands, but I was rubbish at everything else. I came away from school with just four GCE O levels, technical drawing, maths, physics, and religious knowledge. But it was at high school at the age of 15 when I had what I call my Paul moment. Religious education was never taken seriously at the school and usually involved being told to open the Bible at a particular page and read until the end of the lesson. But on one occasion, we had a teacher who did something very different. He took the time to explain what a parable was and how Jesus used them in his teaching. That was when the penny literally dropped for me. It was like putting a penny in one of those seaside one-armed bandits which came up with bell, 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 you know, ka-ching, and you've got the jackpot, an outpouring of pennies. And from that moment on, my whole outlook on church and worship changed. Until that moment, because we'd had the same readings year after year, and the same sermons I seem to remember, the Bible readings took on a whole new dimension, a whole new meaning, not stories, but teachings. 
Now in May 1968, like many of my generation, I left school and got a part-time job while waiting for my examination results. I got a job washing dishes at the Trenton Gardens Ballroom. Thousands of teapots, cups, saucers, plates and cutlery passed through my hands. Six days a week, ten hours a day, two and six an hour, twelve and a half p and new money. It also meant I couldn't go to church. And I can't still explain my feelings at that time, but I had a void in my life. It was a void that I couldn't fill for five months until I got a full-time job and returned to church where I've remained ever since. Every year from Christ dying on the cross on Good Friday until his glorious rising on Easter Day, I recall the memory of that void as it helps me to reflect on just how those first disciples must have felt at that time. In June this year, I will have completed 39 years as a licensed reader in the Church of England. Now my initials are JAC, which I believe is quite fitting because I consider myself to be a jack of all trades and master of none. I still struggle daily with my faith. Reading my Bible and praying doesn't come easy to me, and I often feel unworthy. But I know that God knows me, and he accepts me for what I am, and he's working on me for what I can be. My prayer is that through my life, through my ministry, if I have brought one person to know God, brought light into the darkest corners of any of the lives of those whom I have come into contact with, then it's all been worthwhile. I pray that you will all come to know God in your own lives and that I may come to know him better with each day.
The reading is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, the parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with her plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Are you feeling a little bit guilty at uh, this time of lockdown? Um, maybe you're feeling a little bit guilty because you are starting to enjoy certain aspects of lockdown and you feel that because it is an incredibly serious uh, problem and for some people I know it'll be incredibly worrying and incredibly uh, saddening and uh, threatening. But for some of us, we are maybe starting to quite enjoy certain things about it, the different lifestyle, especially if you're a little bit antisocial or if you're a, a little bit lazy. The fact that the government has told you that you must stay at home and not go out and not do any work, um, you're quite enjoying sort of cancelling things in your diary uh, and staying in bed a little bit longer. And if we're honest, maybe, we're maybe even enjoying not having to get up in the morning and get all the family out to go to church. Um, that's probably a little bit not quite nice. Uh, staying in our pyjamas and worshipping in bed and being able to stream from churches all over the country and all over the world as well, of course, as our local church, uh, might be something that we're a little bit enjoying if we're honest. Well, for some of us, we'll be hating this lockdown because we are creatures of routine. And maybe even if though we're not going to work, we're getting up at the same time. I hope we're not putting our work clothes on to all that sort of thing. But, you know, almost that feeling of, you know, just being in sort of the stuff we wear at on our days off makes us feel a little bit guilty. And we like to keep routine. Well, there's one routine that Jesus told us that we must keep up come what may. And that was prayer. Jesus told that we must persevere in prayer. Now, uh, the word perseverance isn't uh, the sort of like sexiest word. And because it's got in the middle of it that uh, phrase or that word severe, which uh, sounds a bit serious. But Jesus told us that we must persevere. In Luke chapter 18, we read that Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. They are to persevere in prayer. And he told a story and uh, a parable. And there's different characters in this uh, parable. The first parable, the first person in the parable, who's the baddie, is the judge. Now, we read that the judge was amoral. He didn't care about what people thought about him. He didn't even care what God thought about him. We've also got a widow. Now, obviously, the widow was female, which is a bit obvious, but she's a female in a very male dominated society in Jesus's day. She was not only female, she was on her own. She wasn't just on her own. She probably had no or very, very little income. There was very little respectable work that a woman on her own could do. On top of that, she most likely had dependents. She had children eating her out of house and home. She was, as we would say now, vulnerable. She's incredibly vulnerable. And somebody has been trying to abuse her. Somebody has been trying to take advantage of her weak situation. But she's done the right thing. What do we tell people in those sort of circumstances where they're being abused? Tell. 
tell somebody. And she has. She's gone to the person she should have done. She's gone to the judge and says, give me justice. I'm being abused. But unfortunately, this amoral judge doesn't do anything because she's got nothing to give him. She's got no money to give him. She's got no prestige to give him. He didn't bother about caring for a widow and someone who's vulnerable. And so he does nothing. But she persisted. She kept on going. Give me justice. Give me justice. And finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And he uses a strange sort of phrase there, which literally means she's going to keep on poking me in the eye, striking me under the eye. I think we'd use the word nagging going on and on at me. Now, if you've got children in the lockdown, I'm sure you're experiencing this quite a lot. Uh, when they keep going up and saying, please, please, can I do this? Or do I have to? Or can I do something else? Or can't I stay in bed? Or do I have to do this work? Or can't we? And just because you're going mad locked in in those four walls, you give in. And that's it. Once you've given in, that's that's the end. Isn't it? But this woman has kept on going. And so the corrupt judge gives in. The persistent widow wins. It is a how much more story. Jesus tells quite a lot of how much more story. How much more will the righteous judge of the universe, God Almighty, give his chosen ones justice if this corrupt judge gave in, gives in? There are other how much more stories. Luke tells others in some of the chapters beforehand. What about the persistent neighbour? I'm sure you know that story well, where there's a guy waiting. He's got some friends coming. They're travelling uh, up to him. He's got the food ready. He's got a meal ready for them, but they don't turn up. No mobile phones in those days. He's no idea where they are. And it gets to that point. It's starting to go dark. It's getting to that point when the food is going to go off. And this is an age before refrigeration. And so he's got meat out. It's going to be no good to eat the next day. So he's probably a good Yorkshireman as well. He thinks, well, I might as well eat the whole lot myself. So he just gets the family together and they have a right good meal. Of course, when the last bit of food has been eaten, there's a knock on the door. His friends, his visitors have turned up and they're very apologetic. They say there's been a, a camel pile up on the motorway. I don't know what it is. I'm sorry we're late. They're starving. He's got to give them some sarnies at least. And so he thinks he's got to borrow three loaves of bread. So he goes to his neighbour, he knows quite well, and he goes and knocks on the door. The door is shut, which is the crucial bit of this story. I don't know about you, if we did a little um, a little interactive stuff now, I know we can't because this isn't a live stream, but if we if we could do a bit of an interactive bit now, I would ask you to press on your keypad the time that you think it is too late to ring somebody up that you don't know very well. Okay, what time in the evening is too late to ring up somebody? And I know you're all thinking in your head now, if you're an adult, you're thinking in your head now, the number nine. Nine o'clock. It's become a sort of like the unwritten rule. You don't ring somebody after nine o'clock because well, they might be in bed at nine o'clock. Maybe you lot are in bed at nine o'clock. Do you know, if you ask the same question to teenagers and to children, they say, when is it too late for you to message someone? It's obviously, they don't ring anybody. They don't use a phone in a normal way. Uh, when is it too late to message someone? They look at you as if, what are you talking about? Too late? Is it ever too late? You can message somebody any time. And of course, they do. But for most of us, it's nine o'clock. Now, in Jesus' day, if you went to your neighbor's house and the door was shut, it meant go away. It wasn't an invitation to knock on the door because they lived their life with the door open outside. It's a hot country. As soon as it cooled off and they're going to bed, they shut the door and they go to bed. That was it. So when he knocks on the door and he finds out they're all asleep in bed because he's told this by his angry neighbour, he's not surprised. He knows this. Maybe other neighbours around the, along the street are opening the windows and telling him to shut up and go away. But it says that he kept on knocking. So eventually the neighbour 
gives him three loaves of bread or lends him three loaves of bread, not because he cares about the bloke too much, but because of his shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. He just kept calm and carried on knocking on the door, knocking on the door. And of course, the point is, how much more will God give us what we need when we knock? In fact, Jesus says, ask and you'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door of heaven will be opened to you. Persist in prayer, knocking on heaven's door. He also told a little bit more in the same chapter in Luke. He says, look, you lot, I know you're having a right difficult time with all your kids in lockdown. We didn't quite say that, but he may have done. He says, look, you lot, even though you're not perfect parents, if your child says, please, please, I'm hungry. Please, can I have some bread? You don't go out into the garden, find a rock which looks a bit like a crusty loaf and give it to your kids and say, break your teeth on that. You know, if they ask for a fish and chips, you don't go and find your pet snake, batter it. Well, this sounds awful, doesn't it? Batter him to, <laughs> with batter uh, and put it on the plate and say, get that down your neck. No, of course you're not. And if they ask for a boiled egg, you don't go to the pet shop and find a scorpion egg and give it them. So when they knock the top off the uh, boiled egg, there's a tail thrashing around with a big sting on the end. You no, know, if you, as not perfect parents, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask. But going back to the original parable of the persistent widow, what are we to ask for? We are to ask for justice. Jesus says, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. And then the bit that I like. And quickly. We don't like waiting around. I will see that they get justice and quickly. Now, why are we to pray for justice? It's a bit of an odd thing. We've just gone through Easter. We're still in the Easter uh, season. We know that Jesus died on the cross not to give us what we deserve, but what we don't deserve. We're given the free gift of eternal life because Jesus has won it for us. We don't deserve that. It is a free gift. So what? how are we meant to ask for justice? Well, really, justice is the just rule of the king of the universe. When Jesus was asked again a few chapters before in Luke's gospel, when he's asked, Teach us how to pray, Jesus. Jesus tells the Lord's Prayer. And in that, he says, pray your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What is the central part of prayer? It is praying that heaven will be seen on earth, that heaven will break through, that the kingdom of God will break through on earth, that the justice of God will be seen here on earth before the Lord returns. We're in this time of lockdown. We're in this time of crisis. What are we to pray? We're to keep on praying. We're to keep calm and keep carrying on praying. We are to persist in prayer and we are to pray that we will see God's kingdom on earth, that we will see God's hand on earth, that we will see his will done here on earth. You know, we can see that in many ways. Many people are talking about things that are good that have come out of this time, uh, that communities coming together uh, when we're starting to appreciate what is essential and what isn't essential. Many people are saying that after this is gone and the virus is controlled and the lockdown is gone, we will not go back to where we were. This is the new normal. Well, we will see. But people are noticing good things. And I think they're beginning to see something of God in the midst of all of this. Now, we can see that globally or nationally. But what about our own lives? What about our own personal lives? What is God saying to us through this lockdown? What is God saying to us about our family and our friends and our work and the way that we see things? We're to pray, we're to knock on heaven's door and ask that he will reveal us to us 
what we need to know and what we should be doing with persist in prayer. Luke chapter 18 finishes with an enigmatic rhetorical question. It says, however, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And you wait for the answer from Jesus. And it doesn't come. It's just there, hangs. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? What are we to do when things challenge our faith? When things challenge whether God is truly in charge and are we thinking, is God in this? Where is God in this? We're to keep the faith. We're to keep persisting in prayer because as we pray, heaven gets very close to us. The kingdom of God gets very close and we start to see things through God's eyes and we start to ask for his help and we see him starting to work in our lives. We start to understand more about God, even in the midst of this lockdown. You know, on the Easter time, isn't it interesting that the risen Jesus appears to the disciples through what? Through locked doors. And it's maybe at this time of lockdown that we will meet the risen Jesus in a really new and vivid way. That's certainly my prayer. Amen.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. darkness seems to hide his face oh, rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil in Christ alone Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone and faultless stand before the throne and faultless stand before the throne Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. He Father God, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you that right now in our own homes, we can talk to you, our living God, who loves us and knows us infinitely. We thank you that we can talk to you, that we can open our hearts and our minds, that we can share our concerns and worries. We can share our hopes and dreams. We can uh, ask for help. We can ask for peace. We can ask for joy. We can ask for wisdom. We thank you that you are not a distant God, that you are a God who longs to know us and for us to know you. So right now I pray for each one of us watching in our own homes that you would reveal once more by your spirit how deep you love each one of us and how much you want us to know you and to talk to you through prayer. Lord, when there is a time, there is so much that we can pray for. There are so many needs around us in our communities, in our cities, in our towns, in our countries and the world. In a time of such uncertainty we know that you are there for us that you are our foundation that you are our rock that you are our hope in times of trouble so our prayer today is that you would lead us and you would invite us into a deeper and stronger and more committed friendship with you that our prayer today is that you would teach us to pray once more again. Teach us 
to talk to you, show us how to share our minds and our hearts and to walk closely with you. And so as Jesus, as you taught us when you were on the earth, we pray together now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Isn't it great to spend some time concentrating on the importance of prayer? We've been together and we've sung, prayed, and learned so much about prayer today. And whether you're a regular prayer or you're new to praying, I heard something which really encouraged me today. Apparently, Google searches for the word prayer have rocketed, which can only be great news. It all helps to build a relationship with God. So what follows are a few hints, tips, resources that may be useful for you. Don't worry if you're trying to remember them as we go along because they will all be available listed at the end of the service. Sometimes simply stilling ourselves by lighting a candle and watching the flame flicker and burn helps us to still our thoughts and to come into the presence of Christ because as Christians we know that Christ is the light of the world. He tells us so himself. Even in the darkest of times, that light can never be extinguished. So maybe we could thank him for that as we look at the flame. Or perhaps we could uh, download an image of some beauty of God's creation and think of that, of the awe and the wonder as we listen to the amazing bird song at the moment. And we thank him for his creation and for entrusting it to us. If you prefer a little more guidance, how about listening to or reading the lyrics from a favourite hymn? John, whose testimony we heard earlier, his favourite hymn is When I survey the wondrous cross, which includes the words, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. This like so many other hymns, is based directly on scripture. Or how about something like Cornerstone from Hillsong Worship, which speaks of our hope being built on the one who is able to make us strong in the most stormy of times. He remains Lord of all. But what about if we are praying and at times we do not feel we're being heard. Well, we are, but there's a great book by Pete Gregg called God on Mute, which addresses this. Ask if you want to borrow it. He cites the following, which is an example of a prayer found written on a hiding place wall by a Jew in 1945, who was hiding from the Gestapo but it's pertinent to us in today, current climate. I believe in the sun when it doesn't shine. I believe in love when I am alone. I believe in God even when he is silent. Lovely words. For specific daily help, there are lots of booklets such as Word for Today or The Bread of Life that are available. And they link both prayer and words to scripture, as do some excellent online resources. I use the free Lectico Divino app daily, and this again does the same thing. It focuses our mind on scripture and prayer. Or why not look online for the 247prayer.com Help Me to Pray website. 
This provides great creative ideas on how to pray and they are so simple and easy to use. Or a final offering is EncounteringPeace.org who produce a sacred, mindful daily devotional. There are lots of good resources to help us with prayer. Why not decide to check at least one of them out as our service ends? I promise you that you won't regret it. God longs to hear from us and we learn so much by taking time to listen to him. Thank you for joining us today and remember prayer ideas will follow at the end of the service and also there'll be a means by which you can get in touch with us if you'd like us to pray for specific things or to help you in any way. So all that remains now is for me to offer you God's blessing now and for the days ahead. So let's pray. To a troubled world, peace from Christ. To a searching world, love from Christ to a waiting world, hope from Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love today and always. Amen.